want to ask this because we are a little community here in this space. I just want to ask, and you can put your hands up and shout out, who is actually aware of um, your head bone? Is, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, good, good. And, uh, so, well, not, but not many. And how many of those know of his connection to South Ayrshire and particularly Air? Yes, so we, we didn't. We didn't know. And I've worked in South Ayrshire for oh, 17, something like 17 years. Not from Air myself, but um, um, this is the story of, of, of that connection and how we looked at that and how we engaged our communities um, to, to do that. Um, I've got a mixture of slides. I'm going to talk. If you can't hear me, um, no, please, please shut out. Ten minutes. Excuse me, could you just speak into the microphone? Yeah, because it's I'm a, rather it's, deaf and that's I'm just fine. not hearing. That's, is that okay? Yes. Okay. That's better. Just to give you a tiny bit of background, we I'm based at South Ayrshire Council Libraries and Museum Service. We're at the Zell House Museum and Galleries, which is on the outskirts of Ayr. We worked with the National Museums of Scotland in 2015, and we were a partner host of their Next of Kin touring exhibition. Uh, we had to work with local history and local families to um, uncover um, stories of the First World War, which was based um, on the um, memorabilia and uh, ephemera almost of what had been left behind by those who had um, been in the war. So quite a lot of um, great aunts uh, and uncles um, possessions in, in the, you know, who had uh, died in the war, whose families had inherited this. We had um, over 4,500 people came to see this exhibition. 22% of um, those visitors were new to the museum, so we were really impressed by our by our reach and our um, response. Um, and uh, during the exhibition, over 300 people completed a postcard telling us about their family stories from the First World War, which you know is 100 years ago. So we were really quite amazed at the response. At the same time, Roselle House, we sit in Roselle Park, and we were developing what was a felled woodland site, um, which was um, uh, taken down um, uh, and cleared. Uh, the, there were nine trees large enough to be carved into uh, a shape and the parks manager at the time had a dream that these would be soldiers emerging from the trees and from the forest. So we were um, again able to offer a kind of whole day experience for um, learners and for uh, tourists to come to Roselle Park and it was a really powerful um, subject matter. Um, you can see in the in the background, you know, the desolate nature of this cleared site, which involved cutting hand hand cutting trees, and then getting a digger in. Um, as part of our next of kin engagement, we had to assign a room available, and we had to fill it with something that was was you know kind of stayed put, and we used our own collections to do this. Um, and in doing so, we um, discovered that we had actually eight pieces of work by Muirhead Bone, which is quite a big collection of one person's work in our relatively small local history collection. Um, so we wanted to find out a wee bit more, especially when um, the scenes that we were seeing, I hope you can see, were very similar to what we were actually seeing in the park. And a lot of people were saying the park itself was very much um, evocative of a First World War scene. So um, we looked into Muirhead Bone and, sorry, um, we found this brilliant picture, a totally iconic picture of um, your head bone. And I was completely struck by, by a picture. And I think it's really important you know, to, to take a, a jumping off point from somewhere. And if you've got a, a picture or an image or an object that really t talks to you about a story, then it's, then it's worth kind of looking into. So we wanted to do a wee bit more. There was nothing known about the, the collections that we had in our, in our, in our hands. The, uh, the, the eight pieces of work we had had very little documentation, very little provenance. The staff that had been there sometime knew there was some connection to, to, to bone and air, but it wasn't written down anywhere and I didn't know. Um, and so we applied to Museums Gallery Scotland um, to, um, to investigate this. Um, they have a World War One fund. I think it's just about to finish, but there's one last call just now. And it specifically works with museums to explore the impact and legacy of World War I on Scotland's families and communities and its continuing resonance on modern life. So a really nicely summarised um, project uh, aim there from them. And we, we fitted this completely. And we decided to, to design a community-based project which would help us gather the research that was required to supplement our collections and offer the opportunity to engage in um, some artistic practice. Um, and all of this would come together in an exhibition. 
um, which is again like the first group um, we felt that the best way to actually um, showcase uh, the results so um, the Museums Gallery of Scotland uh, funding if you've not seen it before um, and we can access it because we're an accredited museum but it is incredibly well structured it's very very easy to submit to they are very helpful throughout the way um, and um, they were they were you know it was a really good fund and if you are a community group looking to work um, with partners I always recommend you know uh, uh, breaking down the barriers and getting into the your local authority museum service because um, they should be able to work with you on that and you can see from the list there that we we really were going to fit their aims so how did we start well we, we knew it was big, we knew it was risky, but there was ultimately huge challenges ahead. There were challenges in scale, partnership working, co-creation, cohesion, communication. There was challenges in timetabling, there was challenges in sharing and meeting deadlines. Um, so much so that the Museums Gallery of Scotland asked us to do another kind of risk assessment because they really thought, mm, this is ambitious. But um, one of the themes of their funding is for uh, projects to develop braver and innovative museum practice. So, so that it, we're really keen on doing this. Um, so we brought together uh, at the start a kind of research group. Um, we worked with Volunteer Action South Ayrshire, who have a great volunteer role description form, which we completed and sent out. Interestingly, they said um, they were really struggling to find placements for volunteers who expressed an interest in history. Um, there just wasn't anything on the horizon for volunteers to engage with. So we really um, helped them um, fill a gap there. And we asked people to, to step up and help us research the life of Muirhead Bone. Did help that in the project format, I said David Muirhead Bone, I completely the wrong name. Um, but we worked um, on with various people from all different kinds of backgrounds, some recent graduates, some retired people, um, some people looking for work experience, um, uh, and each contributed a unique skill and there's just a range of them there you know Ron in the middle there um, ex Watton engineer put, put a project plan together for me help me can articulate what we were trying to do it, he was brilliant and um, Alex the young man there he found some intrig intriguing links on the dark web I said Alex stay away from the dark web um, <laughs> He checked the local newspapers. We had um, people who just volunteered for an hour. They came along and did a bit of internet research for us. This was information that was all kind of out there. It just wasn't owned by us. And we didn't know anything about it. It certainly wasn't recorded in our collections at all. One thing was James, he did the family history. Now, family history of the bones, particularly in air, is incredibly complicated. And that's where the confusion arises because there are there are, there are David Muirhead Bone, um, Muirhead Bones, and uh, Drummond Bone, who's also an artist as well. And quite a lot of local people had connections with the family and thought that this was a nephew or an uncle. And in actual fact, the line is, was quite straight and the family were in there and then left. Um, the other thing about the family history is, of course, it costs money. You know, it's a pay-as-you-go site, and we use the Carnegie Library as a good base with a great amount of sources. But at the end of the day, you know, there was money had to be, be shelled out to get certificates and such. We also contacted, uh, uh, were able to contact Bill Smith, who uh, is the ex-chair of the Fleming Collection, and who had contributed some. Uh, he'd done the research on the family and, and published this brilliant book. Now I've got some items with me and I've got a table upstairs so after the end of this year welcome to come and have a look at this great book and, and he actually sent us a copy of this book which is actually really difficult <coughs> to get so very generous both in sharing knowledge and in contributing sources but I think the main person for us was Patricia Andrew who if you don't know she wrote The Chasm in Time which is World War One in Scotland's art um, and I really wanted her on board as a critical friend I felt it was really important for us to be able to to make sure that the volunteers <coughs> were producing um, uh, robust research that uh, was correct and embedded in fact. Okay, they can interpret it slightly different, but at the end of the day, we wanted to be able to put up a, a, an exhibition that was robust. Both Patricia and Museums Gallery Scotland said, well, what, why do you need me? In actual fact, she was incredibly useful throughout the project and contributed a lot. She put, she put us in touch with um, potential donors um, and uh, lenders. She uh, added, she came down to air and met the volunteer group. She provided a really nice sense of context so we were able to see what we were finding in, in that sense. But she was also an error, error authority I and mean, I knew nothing myself. And at the end of the process, she was a really useful, neutral um, 
uh, editorial uh, um, uh, authority. So there would be discussions between what the volunteer wanted to say, uh, between what she thought should be said, and ultimately we were able to make a decision based on our aims and objectives. So she was really um, very important to us, to me. So what did we find? I'm just going to talk a wee bit about what we found. We found, um, and it was Michael found this, um, there's over 800 pieces of Muirhead Bones work in the British Museum collection, which is all available online. And copyright, um, I think my colleagues were saying, Monique, Monique was saying earlier, yeah, copyright is a problem, and it didn't help that the family member who is the, the um, copyright holder had sadly died. But through, um, through the means of sharing, um, we were able to circumnavigate that. And what I would say in a copyright response is it's all about risks. And if you feel that you're, you can handle the risk and that you can actually put this stuff on the wall that actually is okay and that you would take it down if there was a problem, we actually felt we could go for this. It is 100 years old at the end of the day, we weren't doing anything for profit. So what we <coughs> found was that Muirhead Bone started printing in 1898, uh, was incredibly successful at this, it was, it was a natural talent. He had been struggling as an artist for some years before that. In 1900 he decided to use his family connections to air and he came and he hired a studio um, in, uh, in air where he had and advertised these classes. Now, um, these are on the British Museum website, but they're actually um, separate, so they don't come up together, but actually they are, we found, part of the same item, so it's a kind of folio here. And he'd sent this out to people in air saying, I'm going to come down and do some art classes. He was living with his auntie in, in a new wee cottage off of uh, Racecourse Road, and he just basically loved um, Ayrshire. He, when you look back at his back catalogue, actually, he's done some significant work. Because Ballantry Road, one of his masterpieces, again, is based in South Ayrshire. So we started to see a real connection and a love for our town and our area. And this is a view <coughs> from the studio of what is the, the Sandgate and the, the church, um, the town hall spire iconic buildings which everyone sees in air every day and he started helping us think again about what his time here and then obviously about what he went on to see on the western front and we kept referring back to that really great picture of him in the mud in, um, in the psalm. Um, I'm just going to check my notes as to where we are. Uh, he, he was then and sadly he um, failed in this enterprise and uh, nobody turned up and he sat on his own in the studio uh, uh, with those shows, and I remember one of my artist colleagues saying, "Bloody air! You know, it's it's a, such a difficult um, place to have art classes and uh, um, and creative practice." We so failed, um, and he was really um, stunned by this because he paid for a year's worth of um, of rent on this property, um, and he was struggling, wanted to get married, he was he wanted to to start uh, his life, so um, he was then bitten by a dog down Air Beach. And he settled out of court with the dog owner who, and who awarded him £50. And he took that money and he went to London with his Glasgow swagger and he started again. And he was, he was at the same time as doing this work in air and, and, and trying to kind of concentrate his efforts. He was at the same time doing work in Hunterian, uh, at, the, at the Kelvin Grove Park. Um, you know, he was gaining a really good reputation. So this 50 pounds from this man in air was really crucial to him being able to go to London. And it was then in 1916, age 40, that he was um, going to be conscripted. And they said, actually, we're not going to conscript you. We're going to make the first World War official artist and that's how his career kind of started and, and he never made, made it back to, to uh, South Ayrshire and, and remained in, in England, obviously became involved in the Second World War as well. So I like to think we were really kind of <coughs> influential in his, in his practice and his resilience as an artist. Um, so we looked again at um, where his studio was and I don't know if you know Air but this is again an iconic building, I don't know if I can show you here, this is his studio here. Mm. Okay, this was what was there before. This was the new build building. Um, it was built and occupied by James A. Morris, the architect. So we're seeing links between the architect and you know, Bone, who obviously trained in an architect's office to start with. Um, and this is a view of um, what he was seeing back in, in 1900 and what you can kind of see now. Obviously, I haven't got into that building because kind of get into that building but it just you know on, this was taken actually on Remembrance Day uh, last year when I was walking through the town and the town was empty as, as people were at Remembrance Services and it really made me think about you know um, um, in your head bone and his uh, what he saw with his eyes and of course if you know his work his, his observation was absolutely critical to his uh, success 
So the, the volunteers were all working in the Carnegie Library. They were looking at sources. They were looking in different local museums. They were looking in uh, national collections as well. Back at the museum, we were uncovering what we had. We took away all of our um, the mounts in the original frames. We actually found this hidden little man here who had been obscured. Can you see the line there of the original mount? So he was there. So we found complete, somebody completely new. Um, and we found more subtle things as well. For example, this is the jail, uh, air jail, air, air, air prison, um, which uh, was down, it's no longer there, but it was down there. Here's evidence of um, Muirhead Bones' architectural uh, um, focus. You know, he, he, he loved buildings and he loved um, uh, change and uh, demolition. Um, so this is his great, and this is a copy of what we have. We have his, his proof. Um, but he, he got to the end of that proof and then would mark it in your head bow, and that's an MB in reverse there. I want you to look at the horse at the front here, you see the wee horse. So one of the volunteers found this picture in the local history library, which is the, the air prison being demolished in 1931, and I think it's the same horse, come on, that is yeah. such, <coughs> such a similar stance. If it's not the same horse, it's it's daughter. Um, but this is, you know, council workmen and, and you would definitely have been, um, if he'd been in there, would have been around taking a, a sketch of that at the same time. So we gathered a lot of information about Muirhead Bone, we wanted to share it with people and we wanted to make sure that we were reaching as wide as people as possible. So the funding allowed us to employ um, a, a master printer and two print assistants and we asked people to come together and uh, bring with them their own inspiring landscape. So moving away from the war as such, but thinking again about what is iconic to us in South Ayrshire, what are the buildings, and of course, that was a really interesting exercise on its own because we had St John's Tower, which you heard of this morning, you know, Green and Castle, um, you know, they're all there, and I've got some prints with me today and I, and I can show you them um, later on. And what was really important for me was that the research group took that journey with us as well. We were able to do that. I think that was one of the risks to start with, was that the research would be done and then the print would be done. And that's not what we wanted to happen. We want all of the learning to carry through in, in a continuous thread. And this is Fiona. Fiona was brilliant. She was working in a kilt shop. She was a new graduate from Glasgow Carlatorian. And she actually ended up um, uh, working with the uh, schools. So we wanted to target schools. I think somebody said this morning, the schools are so difficult and they are. So I think it is kind of uh, in particular important to target schools and engage with them. In our town, Air Academy is moving, it's moved now from its site in the centre of town. We wanted to talk to them about travel, about movement, about um, leaving a landscape behind and, and going into a new landscape as well. And they were blown away by what they saw in New Headbones work. Um, and we were, we are really lucky. And you know how sometimes a history repeats itself. And you, you don't really aware of it, but Ian McNichol is a master printmaker. He now stays in Air, not far from where Muirhead Bone would be staying. He won the Royal um, Academy print show uh, I think two years ago and was included in the show last year as well. A local, a local uh, guy, um, originally from, from Glasgow as well. So you know, history is, is a brilliant thing. So he came and, and, and we engaged with uh, 50 different people <coughs> who uh, made a copper print, talked about how you would reverse, who would do that, how we would work in the field, all of these kind of ongoing conversations um, and uh, along with the, the local pupils. Uh, and then we put together the exhibition and there was a time where I had to gather everything together and work out what we had found, how we were going to talk about it, looking at what the, the volunteers had said. Um, you'll see in the glass case here that we borrowed um, somehow new head board volumes and uh, the volunteers were asked to kind of choose different scenes and, and explain why they had chosen them. And um, I, I think I mentioned one of the risks. Obviously, you know, we had an exhibition in mind. We, we didn't know what we were going to produce. So I tried to make sure that we had some things to say and we were able to, to get back um, through the kind kind of cooperation of the Fleming Collection and uh, Edinburgh City Council. We were able to put the, the Air Race Course um, story together. This is two different paintings that were done by Muirhead Bone, almost one way, and then the other one on the race course in oil, 1900 definitely when he was working in air. These pictures are known, but just not known to have been connected in that way. Um, and so we put them together. And while, while we were there at the exhibition, we met another volunteer, Eddie English, who knows all about the, the race course. And, um, 
But the best bit for me was the, our feature wall, which showed 50 prints that were done by um, participants um, and the third year art um, pupils from Mayor Academy. You really cannot tell the difference between a, a professional artist who came and learned to one of the third year pupils. In fact, I think the third year pupils were better. Um, and uh, then we had a great opening night and we were able to invite Joanne Orr from Museums Gallery of Scotland down and that was great for us as a museum service to kind of get that to get kind of input from them and, and it was really great. I'm, I'm finished now but I've got some extra slides I can whiz through them if you, if you like. So yeah, Muirhead Bone, brilliant at art, was a drawer as, as soon as he was born um, and uh, came from a completely creative family. Um, his uh, father had been born an heir and eventually moved down and, and Muirhead Bone always had links to heir. So he starts um, doing some drawing down in South Ayrshire, down Ballantrae, Lendl, Lendl Foot. Um, the Ballantrae Road is the, the masterpiece here. It's a, it's a masterpiece not of his work, but also of that type of print. I mean, it is stunning to see, and we were able to borrow one of these for the, for the show. Really interesting image. This is Air Bridge, but he's obviously sitting in the water. So this would have been seen by the people of, of Air and, and noted, I'm sure. Um, the local newspapers were really disappointing in their evidence. So there was no mention, but he must have been known um, to the people. And you know, uh, this, this, and also the, the the line of buildings that that go away in the background are something that we're really looking at now in terms of the Air Riverside development. Um, this is my personal favourite because um, it's the Air Seafront. So this is where you would have met that dog, who we think was was named Jumpy. <laughs> and there's a, there's a great synergy between Muirhead Bone and the dog and bones and dogs loving bones, I don't know. Um, but here is Air Esplanade. And again, this is on the British Museum's website. Copyright is incredibly um, difficult, but, um, we, but we included it. So this shows the Air Town Hall, um, Air um, Sheriff Court, uh, the Air Prison, which is no longer there. So you've got county buildings in there now. This is the, we worked out on a map, this is the canvas, this is the canvas dune, no, this is the dune foot laundry, okay? And uh, I did one of the prints, and that is St John's Tower from my couch, um, because I'm a friend of St John Tower as well. And it's really, really, it was really great for me, because I actually can see your headphones studio from my from my bedroom, had always loved that building, but I didn't really know anything about it. So for me, it broadened my landscape completely. So rather than looking at the tower, we're starting to look beyond that as well. Um, yeah, you can just see me there on the top. That's it. Thank you.